Hello, everybody. Welcome to this audio lecture, which will be in lieu of class on Monday and on Wednesday while I'm away in Washington, D.C. I hope you all had a restful and relaxing spring break and had a chance to um, have some fun. Uh, hopefully, you also had a chance to get outside and enjoy the weather uh, and see some cool plants. Today, I'll be talking about the eudicots. Um, and be giving an introduction to some of the major groups of them, and then also uh, specifically focusing on some families that are uh, important here in Arkansas. Now, if you recall the major groups of angiosperms, I hope that this is familiar by now. Uh, we have the anagrade, the magnoliids, the monocots, and the eudicots. So, the eudicots uh, make up about 70% of the diversity of angiosperms, and we'll be talking about these this clade for the rest of the semester. Now, remember that the term eudicots is distinct from the term dicots. Um, early molecular phylogenetic studies showed that what people used to call dicots, plants that had two cotyledon, are not actually a monophyletic group. Uh, in fact, the plants that people have referred to as dicots include uh, members of the anagrade and magnoliids and eudicots. Uh, so the feature of having two cotyledons is more appropriately considered a plesiomorphy. And while it still might be useful in identifying eudicots, many of them do have two cotyledon, uh, you should be careful uh, just as being careful about identifying the monocots based on uh, three petals or sepals in groups of three. Now, you'll see that there's the care, you might be curious about the ceratophyllales um, as not being included here with the eudicots or any of these other groups. This is a really interesting group of a genus of aquatic plants that until very recently has had very uncertain placement in the phylogeny. And for the purposes of this class, you don't need to know anything about it, uh, but in case you're curious uh, as to why it's not included in the list of major groups of angiosperms, um, that's, that's why. The primary apomorphy for eudicots is having tricolpate pollen. Tricolpate pollen is a type of pollen in which there are three apertures along the surface. This is in contrast to the ancestral state of monosulcate pollen, in which there's only a single aperture or pore uh, through which, for example, the pollen tube can germinate. You may recall seeing images of monosulcate pollen uh, in previous lectures when I showed uh, pollen from lilium um, in the monocots and also uh, magnolia pollen. You also may recall that I talked about the rapid um, diversification of angiosperms shortly after uh, the origin of flowering plants. And that one of the ways we know this is through uh, rapid diversification of pollen forms in the Potomac Formation of uh, North America. From this fossil record, we uh, can see that the origin of the eudicots was very soon after the origin of all angiosperms. And moreover, uh, we see that even the eudicots uh, were beginning to rapidly diversify at this time. That's because although uh, tricolpate pollen is considered an apomorphy, there are many variations on this theme. And in fact, many eudicots can have more than three apertures and might vary in the number, shape, and position of these different pores. Um, but all of them are derived from a tricolpate type. Um, and so therefore, we can call it and consider it uh, an apomorphy. In fact, this is really the only synapomorphy of note in the eudicots. As I mentioned, uh, one main plesiomorphy is having two cotyledon, and you should be able to recall what other lineages also have two cotyledon besides the eudicots. 
There are several other distinguishing features uh, that can be used to identify something as a eudicot. Some of these are most characteristic of a subclade of eudicots called the pentapetaly clade uh, that I'll be briefly mentioning a little bit later in this lecture. Some of these other common characteristics include having cyclic flowers um, and so having discrete whirl whirls of flowers um, and specifically having the parts in each whirl alternate with the parts below. So for example, uh, most eudicot flowers will have, you know, their petals uh, op alternate um, with the sepals. And then if there's, say, five stamens, those might be alternate with each of the five petals. You, often, you also will see a differentiation between the calyx and the corolla. Um, and this is homoplasius with differentiated calyces and corollas. Um, and some of the other lineages we've uh, talked about. Finally, the filaments of the stamens are, will be slender. You don't see any examples of petaloid uh, stamens like we saw in some of the monocots uh, and some of the um, magnolias or early uh, divergent angiosperms of the anagrade. Part of the reason for the lack of uh, distinguishing features in this clade, like many of the main clades of angiosperms aside from monocots, is probably due to this rapid diversification. Um, and that you know, there may not have been time uh, for particular morphological features to become fixed. So with that, uh, I really am just going to jump right into the first uh, group which are the ranunculales, is, and these are the order that's sister to all other eudicots. Here's a cladogram from your textbook showing all of the different orders of the eudicots, and you can see uh, the ranunculales there on the left is sister to all the rest. But before I jump into looking at the diversity of this clade and how to identify members of the ranunculales, um, I just want to give you a brief orientation to some of the main clades of the eudicots. So, uh, two of the major subgroups are the rosids and the asterids, uh, which you can see here are also further subdivided uh, into uh, two subclades each. The rosids and the asterids are uh, long standing clades, long recognized. Uh, based on various morphological features that I'll be getting into in the next couple of weeks. Now, those two lineages, plus a number of other orders uh, that, you know, kind of interspersed, some of which are more closely related to the rosids, some of which are more closely related to the asterids, um, and some of which are only uh, related to the common ancestor of the rosids and asterids, all together make up what are called the core eudicots. Um, this is almost synonymous with the pentapetaly clade uh, that was introduced um, in lit assignment number five. Uh, and this clade of, you know, regular, predictable, and world uh, flowers. In addition to the core eudicots, then there are a number of uh, earlier diverging lineages um, that then make up the eudicots. Um, in the broadest sense. The ranunculales has seven families, five of which are listed, listed here on this slide, uh, but only three of which are found in uh, the southeastern United States, the ranunculaceae, the papaveraceae, and the berberidaceae. So I'm only going to be focusing on these three. Um, other families are important elsewhere in the world. Uh, for example, the Menospermaceae family uh, contains a species called Conodendron tomentosum, uh, which is the source of an arrow poison um, used by native Amazonians called curare. And um, in addition to these indigenous uses of that particular plant, um, it's also a great example of a plant that has been adapted and studied by you know, Western medicine 
um, and has now been derived into uh, different compounds that can be used as a muscle relaxant um, and to treat other diseases. Um, but again, in terms of identification, I'm only going to be focusing on uh, those families that you'll likely see um, in North America here. Now, the Ranunculaceae family is a wide-ranging family. It's found uh, pretty much everywhere um, around the world, aside from Antarctica and the Sahara Desert. Um, there's 62 different genera, over 2,000 species, um, and just a you know really common uh, family overall. So the name of the genus comes from uh, the Greek rana uh, for frog. Um, because, and because many of these plants, not all of them, uh, but many of them grow in wet habitats or music environments. Now, the sepals and petals will generally be unfused, and there'll be five sepals and five petals. Um, sometimes they can be pretty highly modified, as you can see on this picture of the columbine in the upper right. Uh, you can see here the sepals are red um, and you know very colorful, whereas the petals are, are rolled up and yellow towards the center of the flower. Uh, but other times you get more typical forms uh, like this ranunculus um, at the bottom here. The key features though are you want to look for many stamens and then also many free uh, carpels. Throughout the family, though, there's a high variation in floral structures um, due to diverse pollinators and dispersers, and um, just in general, the important uh, coevolution between these plants and uh, their pollinators. Uh, generally, uh, the fruit is an achene, um, but sometimes the fruit can also be a follicle or, or fleshy, uh, quite rarely. One of the genera we've already seen, or some of you have seen at Cove Creek, um, and it's now a new site ID genus uh, for this coming week. Um, and that's the genus Ranunculus, or the buttercup genus. Now, uh, there are several different species um, that are found around here, and, and many species that are found kind of more broadly. Um, and they can often be difficult to tell apart if you don't have the fruits, um, which are small achenes uh, with tubercules or hooked spines on them. So the morphology, the surface morphology of these fruits is really important um, for identification, but then also for the ecology of these plants. Um, they're dispersed by animals with those hooked little uh, appendages helping to you know, stick to the animal's fur and disperse them. Um, otherwise, you can see typical uh, ranunculaceae features, uh, including the you know five sepals and five petals with many stamens and then many free uh, carpels um, at the inside of the flower. A few other common genera in the ranunculaceae uh, that are found in Arkansas um, and also worldwide in temperate zones um, include uh, delphinium, which you can see here on the right. Uh, this plant is frequently uh, cultivated, you know, grown for its, its beautiful flowers. And this is a great example of uh, nectar spurs. So a nectar spur, right, just an, is this appendage, as you can see um, that these arrows pointing to uh, which is often associated with some sort of animal pollination syndrome. Um, so at the base of the spurs will be uh, nectaries uh, that bees or hummingbirds uh, can then access if they're uh, you know beaks or or proboscises or you know are the right uh, length.
Another example of an important uh, member of the Ranunculaceae is the genus Clematis, um, and these are another diverse group of vines. And you can see these have a, a different uh, pollination syndrome. So these plants are still animal pollinated, uh, but they attract different insects um, through their through pollen rewards. They don't have nectar. Uh, these clematis are again commonly planted horticulturally uh, and can have quite showy flowers um, and also you know very attractive vining you know up a trellis or something like that. Uh, the fruits uh, you can see in this lower picture uh, have these cool appendages on the fruit um, that allows for wind dispersal and so these kind of feathery appendages can catch you know, catch the wind um, and then blow the, the entire fruit off to different, you know, different places. Here's another example, uh, Thelictrum. Uh, these are the meadow roos, and many of them are wind pollinated and dioecious with separate uh, male and female plants, uh, like the images you see here. But there are also some species in the same genus that are insect pollinated and have more showy flowers. One of the other uh, vegetative features that you might have noticed from these pictures that's quite consistent uh, among the Ranunculaceae um, and to a lesser extent the Ranunculales altogether is uh, the compound leaves. Um, and oftentimes the compound leaves will be either singly compound or sometimes even doubly compound. Um, and you can see that here in this picture uh, of the thelictrum on the on the right with these um, you know ternately compound leaves or compound with three leaflets. Among our site ID species um, we've picked up a lot of members of the ranunculales um, looking at some of the other families. Uh, for example Cardalis flavula as I already mentioned as well as a site ID taxon for this week, uh, Nandina domestica. Um, this plant is native to Eastern Asia um, and has these large doubly compound leaves. You'll see these uh, plants planted commonly, uh, you know, here in Conway, even on campus um, as an ornamental. And they, you know, they are really attractive with this bright green foliage and red berries. Um, persisting throughout the year, uh, but they're also can be quite invasive um, in the southeast. Um, and so we'll be adding this one to your site ID list uh, for this week. Um, and of course, you can see it in lab. Another spring wildflower that you might be familiar with, um, although I haven't talked about it in this class, is the May apple. Um, the May apple, or Podophyllum peltatum, is also in the Ranunculales. Um, as the scientific name suggests, uh, the, this plant has these unique uh, peltate umbrella shaped leaves. And usually there'll be, you know, one or two, maybe three uh, per stem coming up out of the ground. Um, if you want to see these in the wild, go out to Cadron Settlement. There's a whole bunch of them uh, just coming up now. And in a few weeks, uh, the ones that will start to flower uh, will have these showy white flowers, as you can see in this image on the right. One of the reasons that so many of these uh, ranunculales have ended up on our site ID list, um, although not this one, uh, is because many of the earliest spring you know ephemerals or spring flowers uh, do come from this group although that's not to say there aren't later summer uh, plant species later summer blooming species in the ranunculales as well the last species in the ranunculales i want to mention um, is not one that is found in arkansas um, or the southeastern united states uh, but is nonetheless very important economically uh, worldwide, and that's Papaver somniferum, um, or the opium poppy. 
Now, this plant is actually agriculturally grown for many different purposes, um, including poppy seeds as a food source, um, for the milky sap in the plant through which uh, opium can be produced, uh, the narcotic, of course, um, and then also other alkaloids um, in the plant can be processed into other um, drugs, such as hydrocodone, oxycodone, um, and others. And then finally, and probably least importantly, uh, many of them are grown as ornamental plants. Now, each of these different uses has special cultivars, um, and so you're really not going to get high levels of opiates um, necessarily in the you know, ornamental poppies that you might want to grow in your garden. Um, but, uh, you know, regulatory agencies uh, don't always uh, understand that kind of nuance when all of these plants have the same uh, scientific name. I, when I was uh, researching this lecture, I uh, came across a story about uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it, and it turns out that he grew poppies um, for, you know, both ornamentally and uh, to harvest opium from them um, on his estate at Monticello. And, and so, you know, after he died, they continued to be grown there as part of the historic and cultural significance of that site. Um, until the in 1987, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency s somehow decided that that was the time that they needed to crack down on these poppies that were growing there. And so they came in and they completely raided uh, the Monticello um, you know, d slashed, you know, dug up and destroyed all of the poppies that were growing, these different, you know, historical cultivars and whatnot. Um, and even, uh, tra like, even uh, destroyed, um, you know, different t-shirts that advertised or had images of these poppies growing on them and all sorts of different things. Um, so sometimes, you know, there can be uh, quite the hype. And if you're interested in that story, um, you could you know, you can read about it um, online for more information. So that's all I have to say about the ranunculales. And uh, I just want to briefly talk about the, the proteales, just so you have that name in, in your head. Um, this is not an important group of plants um, in North America, uh, but they're really abundant in the south southern hemisphere. Um, they have some really large and you know unique and uh, beautiful flowers. Uh, certain species are used in floral arrangements, um, and so you may have come across them in that context. Or, of course, if you have been to you know South Africa or go to Australia, um, you'll see these in very high diversity down there. Um, the name Proteaceae, uh, if you're curious about some of this etymology, comes from the sea god Proteus. Um, and this particular god had a versatility in changing forms. Um, and you can see that manifest in the diversity of different species and, and you know, morphological variation that you see in different species um, of the genus Protea in the Proteaceae. Lots of adaptive radiation, just like Proteus was able to uh, you know, take on many different, uh, many different shapes. The other reason I do want to mention this group is uh, that it, also, it includes the sycamore tree, uh, Platanus occidentalis. Um, at some point in the next few weeks, this tree will be added on to the site ID list. Uh, and I haven't put it on yet uh, because it hasn't leafed out. And so hopefully, um, if you know the seasons move along, uh, we'll be able to see the, the leaves and uh, last year's fruit. Um, at this point, the last year's fruit is still hanging um, in the in the branches of of the trees that are growing um, around Conway here. So, um, Platanus occidentalis is the uh, American sycamore. These have large palmately lobed leaves, as you can see in this uh, picture here, um, and the most distinctive features, in addition to the leaves, 
um, is the bark of this of these particular trees. Uh, the bark is is kind of flaking off, and you can see it's it's bi colored or sometimes different, you know, a number of different hues of, of gray green uh, bark. Um, other vegetative features uh, are some of these large uh, stipules at the base of the petiole that completely encircle the stem. Uh, look like little, little leafy rings along the stem where the leaves are attaching. And then also, as I mentioned, they're very distinctive. Uh, both inflorescences and then infructescences, um, which are these multiple fruits, uh, so derived from many uh, small flowers that then when they become fruits, they fuse uh, into a single unit. And again, as I said, if you walk to um, the uh, Hendricks Creek Preserve, you can see some of these uh, these trees still bare, uh, but with these fruits from last year um, hanging in there. This is the most massive tree indigenous to eastern North America, um, and there are also close relatives uh, found in temperate Europe. Um, so the European relatives are called plane trees. Um, so if you've ever heard of a plane tree referred to in literature or whatnot, um, it's really you know, similar, or the same genus at least, uh, to the uh, sycamore. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, most of the diversity is in this group that are called the core dicots. And um, you've also heard the term pentapetally uh, clade. And the pentapetally plus uh, this other genus called Gunneria, um together form the core eudicots. Pentapetally, um, again, to reiterate what I said a few minutes ago, is noted for its archetypical flower, right? These concentric whorls of floral organs, often in, in five, sometimes in fours, um, and morphologically distinct perianth series, uh, sepals versus petals. But on top of all this, you'll see much modification and specialization of these parts, um, in part due to uh, some of the underlying genetics, like we read about uh, in uh, the lit assignment paper. I'm not going to be talking about the roses and the asterids uh, today. Um, that will be the next few weeks. Um, it'll really be several of these less diverse lineages that are also included in the pentapetaly, um, or the everything else, as I like to say. The Saxifragaceae family um, has about 600 species that are mostly found um, in the you know, north temperate regions. These plants are mostly uh, perennial herbs, um, and can be identified based on their five uh, fused sepals um, and their five distinct petals that are sometimes dissected, um, as in this picture here. Um, and note that the, the fringy parts are the petals, uh, and the other structures um, are sepals. And also notice it's a really good representation of the um, alternate uh, floral parts. So you can, so if you see the sepals um, are alternate with the petals, and then those petals are alternate with the next whorl, which is the stamens, you know, uh, distal to it. Um, and so you get this pattern where the stamens are right on, are even or opposite with uh, the sepals. Now, oftentimes the petals are clawed, and what clawed, what a clawed petal is, is one that has this stalk-like base. Um, you can kind of see that in this little picture here, um, where the base is, is almost, you know, filamentous, or just a little stalk, and then flares out at the end. Okay. 
Um, in the Saxon Brigasi, there can be five or ten stamens. Um, this example with the, the red arrows pointing to it looks like there's uh, ten. And the hypanthium, uh, which I'll explain exactly what that is on the next slide, um, can be, you know, either very prominent or less prominent. Now, all plants in the Saxophagaceae have one style per carpal, uh, but there's usually two carpals per pistil, uh, but there can be up to five. So uh, in both of these examples, you have two fused carpals, and you can see uh, one stamen uh, for each of them. The fruit uh, is a capsule uh, that splits along the septa, or the, um, the little walls separating each carpal from the next ones. Um, or sometimes they're a follicle, which is a single uh, A single carpal that then um, opens to release its seed. The vegetative morphology can also kind of clue you in as to it being in the Saxifragaceae. Um, sometimes the leaves are succulent, um, but more commonly it's easy to see them in rosettes like this, this kind of basal cluster of leaves. Um, and also they can be palmately lobed uh, or sometimes even um, divided or or compound. Sometimes too the leaves will have uh, stellate hairs, so little hairs that all coming out from the same point and make a little star star shaped pattern. The hypanthium is a term for a particular floral structure uh, that's formed by the fusion of the perianth um, and the stamens um, in a, such a way that it forms a floral cup um, encircling the um, ovary. So in this drawing on the upper left, you can uh, see exactly how that works uh, with the base of the stamens and the petals and the steeples all fused um, to form a single structure that then kind of goes all the way around. Uh, this feature has evolved multiple times, um, including in the Rosaceae, uh, you know, Rose family, um, the Gracularaceae, or the currant or gooseberries, uh, Fabaceae, the legumes, um, and the Myrtaceae family. Um, and it's a really useful feature for uh, identification. Here are three examples of different genera that are common here. In Arkansas, um, and are in the Saxifragaceae that you want to, might be on the lookout for. Um, Mitella, which has you know very small and beautifully fringed uh, petals. Saxifraga, um, and Heuchera. Saxifraga um, is can often be found in rocky areas, you know maybe growing on cliffs or um, areas or, you know, crevices like that. Um, and then heuchera can also grow in some of those places and, uh, and is also commonly planted uh, as a horticultural uh, addition to, to the yard. Before I move on, uh, I just want to highlight a few other uh, important saxifragales that are in Arkansas. Um, the first two, uh, liquid ambar uh, styraciflua, or the sweet gum, um, and the hemimulus, um, hemimulus vernalis or hemimulus virginiana, the two species of witch hazel that are here, um, are you know common trees or shrubs that uh, are native to this area. But you also might be familiar with peonies. Uh, those are in the Peonaceae, or represent the Peonaceae family, um, and are also Saxifragales. Or many succulents that you might have um, in, you know, potted plants. 
or you know, uh, floral displays um, come from the family Crassulaceae, which is um, very closely related to the Saxifragaceae. Next up is the Santalales, which is the most diverse group of parasitic plants. The Santalaceae are a distinctive family in that they're photosynthetic hemiparasites. Um, so these are parasitic plants that attach to the roots or stems of other plant hosts in order to uh, acquire water and minerals and other inorganic nutrients. However, most of them uh, can perform their own photosynthesis and you know, are perfectly capable uh, of getting what they need um, in terms of their carbon through the atmosphere. Um, nonetheless, they really can't survive on their own. Um, they're generally obligate parasites because of their other water and, and mineral needs. Um, and in the cases of stem parasites, they need another plant to serve as their you know, physical support as well. This is the most diverse lineage of parasitic plants. Um, and we'll and include and uh, have become an interesting case study um, for you know the for the development of uh, root parasites from or I'm sorry the development of stem parasites from root parasites the flowers are small and inconspicuous um, this commandra umbellata this toad flax has perhaps some of the more conspicuous and um, showy flowers of this group. Throughout North America, we're most familiar with the Santalales through the mistletoes. Um, and many of the mistletoes in at least the northern hemisphere uh, are in are sometimes treated as a separate family called the Viscaceae. And of course, this is the name I had uh, you learn. Um, when I introduce this plant as a site ID taxon. The Viscaceae uh, represent a really interesting example of stem parasites that have evolved from uh, root parasites. If you do an ancestral state reconstruction um, of the mode of parasitism within the Santalales, uh, it's quite parsimonious um, that these stem parasites are, are more nested. The, the stem parasite is a derived state uh, from root parasites. Here in Arkansas, we only have one species um, in the Viscaceae, um, and that's Phorodendron leucarpum. Um, but that particular species is quite widespread, um, and I think something that, that m most of us are you know, familiar with and can see on a day-to-day -day basis, even just by stepping outside, um, onto campus. This plant has, uh, you know, evergreen leathery leaves um, and the fruit is a viscous berry, a uh, little white sticky berry uh, with a single seed inside that aids in its dispersal by sticking to the beaks or other parts of birds um, that then will, you know, fly and try to wipe it off onto the stem of another tree and hopefully a potential host. You may notice the common name for Phorodendron leucarpum is the oak mistletoe, but of course the host range of this plant is much broader um, in Arkansas. It's on you know, oaks, birches, many other uh, types of trees. Some people have suggested that uh, these mistletoes uh, might represent multiple species, you know, more host-specific races, um, but this is a, you know, an ongoing question uh, that, you know, hopefully uh, more careful molecular phylogenetic studies can shed light on. Another common question people have asked me about mistletoes is, do they hurt the tree? Well, while certainly uh, the parasitic relationship is, you know, not helping the tree, um, it really takes quite a large infestation um, of the tree to, before you start to see any uh, major negative effects in terms of, you know, wood biomass or, uh, you know, or, or mortality in the most extreme. 
And at that point, it sometimes becomes a chicken or the egg sort of question, in my opinion. Um, you know, if you see a dying tree with a high parasite load, maybe the reason why the parasites are able to do so well is because other things have already stressed the tree, and the tree is not able to defend itself uh, as well as normally it could have. However, another interesting question is whether this sort of relationship between uh, mistletoes and their host is completely one-sided after all. In the winter time, um, the hosts of these mistletoes uh, have lost all their leaves, and so they're not able to acquire uh, carbon or photosynthates um, in any way. However, uh, we can clearly see that these mistletoes that persist through the winter time are, are green and therefore must have some sort of capacity for photosynthesis. And so the question, which I don't know the answer to, um, and it would be interesting if anyone uh, wanted to look more into this, is does any of the photosynthate that's being produced by these mistletoes end up in its host plant? In which case, it could be thought of as kind of a uh, you know, seasonally dependent uh, mutualism. One example of a clearly documented ecological benefit that mistletoes uh, produce um, for their host uh, comes from the western United States. In this case, it's looking at the three-part relationship between mistletoes, juniper trees, and towns on solitaires, which is a species of bird. So mistletoes uh, can parasitize junipers uh, in the western U.S. You can see a picture of that here on the lower right. Uh, these big kind of yellower balls are the phorodendron that's parasitizing uh, the juniper trees. So if we, you know, consider, we can consider that a negative ecological interaction, you know, all of the water and nutrients that the mistletoe is pulling out of the, the juniper. Now, the bird, this beautiful Townsend solitaire, um, likes to eat the juniper berries, or, you know, strictly speaking, cones. Um, but in, through, in so doing, they're also dispersing the, the juniper seeds. And that conveys a positive benefit onto the juniper. Um, so this is a clearly, you know, a clear win-win mutualism between the bird and the juniper. But now let's look at some of the indirect benefits that the mistletoe might have on the juniper. So the bird also disperses the mistletoe. Again, you know, win-win situation. Bird gets food, mistletoe gets dispersed. Um, and one way that we know that is that these researchers went and they did an experiment in which they looked at mistletoe infected plots and mistletoe uninfected plots. Um, and then they went to see the, main, the mean number of solitaires per hectare, so per unit area. And they found that in regions with mistletoe, there were more birds that hung out um, than regions that didn't have any mistletoe at all. And from that concluded that the fruits uh, are likely what's attracting them. Now, it turns out um, that in these mistletoe infected areas, because there are more birds around, the juniper is actually getting higher um, dispersal from the birds. Um, and so if you measure seedling recruitment, um, so how many new seedlings are, you know, coming up? And look at the mean number of seedlings, juniper seedlings per hectare in regions that are mistletoe-infected stands versus mistletoe-free stands. It turns out that the areas that have mistletoe in them um, have over twice as many juniper seedlings as other places. Now, these researchers did other additional comparisons to try to bolster their conclusions, um, which ultimately were that um, some mistletoe seems to be a good thing for the juniper uh, because you're able to attract these birds that then are dispersing both 
uh, the mistletoe fruits and the juniper fruits. Uh, but eventually, the negative physiological effects probably outweigh any sort of positive dispersal effects. Um, so there's really this relative abundance uh, of these three different organisms that's driving um, whether the ecological interactions are positive or negative. But in any case, it clearly shows uh, that it's not always, you know, win-lose, that these mistletoes aren't always a blight, a total blight on their hosts. The last uh, plant I want to talk about is a really interesting, uh, commercially valuable uh, plant in the Santalaceae. And this is the sandalwood, uh, specifically in the genus Santalum. Um, there's a few different uh, species of sandalwoods that have you know, varying levels of, of quality in terms of their uh, wood and essential oils, which are the parts of the plant that are most economically valuable. These plants have a long-standing uh, cultural and economic significance um, in Eurasia. Um, and in fact, the name Santalum uh, comes from the Persian word for sandalwood. These plants are, are native to India and Southeast Asia, but of course uh, were used you know, throughout uh, Europe and Asia uh, through the um, overland trades. The oil of the sandalwood has been used in traditional medicine, fragrances, uh, making incense from the wood, and then the oils, of course, are um, infused in that wood. Um, and the oils also can also be used for cosmetic purposes. Otherwise, the wood also has uh, value in um, wood carvings and, and other kind of ornamental or decorative purposes. These trees are very slow growing. Um, it'll take at least 15 years for a sandalwood to uh, to start to produce the essential oils that give it its value. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the essential oil is five times more valuable than silver by weight. Um, or in other words, a kilogram of sandalwood oil now sells for about $3,000, uh, but prices are rising very quickly. Because of the long investment in sandalwood plantations, of course, it takes a long time for uh, adjustments to the supply um, to catch up, catch up with um, increases in demand. It's also quite difficult to cultivate these plants, um, which are now grown predominantly in India, but also Australia. And part of the reason for that is that you need to plant both the parasite, the sandalwood, and its host tree. Um, if the sandalwood doesn't attach to a host within one or two years uh, after germination, um, it will die and not be able to mature into uh, the economically valuable mature tree. And so as a result, um, these plants are planted side by side with potential hosts, like in this picture on the right, uh, with the green uh, sapling uh, indicated by the arrow, uh, an acacia plant, and then the sandalwoods will be interplanted uh, so that their roots can, you know, graft together, um, which is how these plants parasitize. People have invested a lot of um, effort in trying to figure out how to synthetically produce sandalwood oil, but the essential oil is actually a, you know, a, a mixture of a number of different important or, and distinct uh, compounds, and so it's not as simple as just trying to synthesize a single chemical, um, but really getting the right balance so that the aromas um, and all of the other properties are um, how you want them to be. And this is just not something that pe uh, people have successfully been able to do yet. So moving on to our last uh, clade, the karyophyllales. This large order of 34 families and over 12,000 species um, contains a large number of plants that for a long time have been known to be closely related, uh, but also 
several other lineages that it's really only been through um, recent phyl molecular phylogenetic methods um, have been shown to be uh, within the karyophyllales. Indicated on this slide here are pictures that represent seven of these uh, families of karyophyllales, uh, six of which are uh, native to or found in Arkansas. And then the last, the Nepenthesi, or um, Asian, Southeast Asian and African pitcher plants, um, are just way cool. And so I had to put them on there also. This slide shows the a cladogram of the karyophyllales. Um, and circled in red is this clade uh, that includes several important morphological synapomorphies. Um, this is how previous botanists have been able, were able to recognize uh, these various families as being closely related, due um, in part to certain reproductive characteristics, uh, such as um, the shape and structure of the ovules, seeds that include perisperm, which is uh, nutritive tissue or nutrients that are stored within the seed as part of the megasporophyte. Um, and not as part of the endosperm or cotyledons, and some biochemical uh, characteristics such as the presence of betalins, a class of compounds that have replaced the red and purple um, anthocyanins that are present in, in most other lineages. In addition to this clade, there are also several non-core uh, karyophyllales they include um, carnivorous plants, uh, the highly invasive tamarisk, and other plants that were not previously thought to be closely related. Among the non-core caryophyllales, I'm only going to um, talk a little bit about two closely two sister families, uh, the Nepenthesii and the Drosseraceae, uh, which are two lineages of carnivorous plants. The Drosseraceae is the sundew family, um, and these, this name um, comes from the Greek Drosseros, uh, which means dewy, and is reference to the glandular hairs that have these droplets of sticky um, you know, sap uh, that, on, upon which it will, insects or other potential prey will stick. This is, in fact, the same family that includes um, Dionea, or the Venus fly trap, um, in which sensitive hairs initiate the closure of traps, and a third genus, Aldrovanda, which are aquatic uh, Venus fly traps, or called the water wheel plant, uh, because of how these traps are um, presented in whorls along the stem. The Drosseraceae are found around the world. Um, and they often will be found growing in wet or boggy areas. Uh, their, car their carnivorous habit um, is due more towards a lack, due to a lack of nutrients than um, any sort of energetic benefits from the prey that it captures. Um, in terms of economic benefit, um, there's you know few practical uses of these plants to humans except, of course, um, them being cultivated as curiosities. I encourage you uh, to pause this lecture and take some time to look at some of the different uh, YouTube video links that I have included in this lecture. Um, you can see some of these different trap mechanisms closing. Um, in, the in the Dionea, uh, this is in response uh, to, you know, touch sensitive hairs that are on the inside of the pad. Um, and in uh, Drosera, the, once the insect sticks to the leaf um, on which these hairs, these uh, sticky glandular hairs are attached, uh, the entire leaf will slowly curl around uh, the prey um, in order to better hold it and eventually soak up uh, the nutrients from the soon to be uh, rotting uh, organism.
The other family of carnivorous plants uh, that's closely related is the Nepenthaceae. And uh, this name comes from the Greek uh, dispelling grief. Penthos being grief and ni meaning not or, you know, dispelling. Linnaeus's, you know, choice of name for this uh, is, you know, perhaps more poetic than many of the other names uh, of plant genera or families. Um, and just was so astonished by this particular plant uh, that in his view, uh, coming across it could dispel any grief or sadness. In these really remarkable plants, the tip of the leaf has been converted into a pitcher uh, or a hollow pitfall trap um, into which uh, small insects or animals will fall. Uh, once they fall into that liquid, a complex and unique uh, microbi microbiotic community uh, begins to decompose uh, the insects, and then nutrients are absorbed into the um, into the leaf surface through the um, the inner lining of the pitcher. Other sorts of adaptations. Um, Increase the you know the chances of uh, successful uh, carnivory, including um, you know scents or nectaries to attract insects, uh, as well as slick um, inner leaf surfaces or hairs that are downward pointing hairs to repel um, anything trying to climb back out. Though there is little need to. Uh, identify these plants using features other than the vegetative part. Um, you can see on the right two images of the uh, flowers and inflorescence, um, a collection of small uh, bisexual flowers on a um, branched raceme. And in these flowers, the stamens are uh, fused um, and form a tube around which, or within which, uh, the style and stigma um, can be found. And so stamens that are fused and form this tube are called monodelphous stamens. Um, and this is the same kind of uh, floral structure that you see in the distantly related um, hibiscus plant. Now, although pitcher plants are primarily associated with, you know, bugs or other critters falling in and, and drowning and strict carnivory, um, not all plant, not all pitcher plants uh, employ this uh, method of acquiring uh, nutrients. Some uh, species are adapted to being pooped in, um, either by bats, as you can see in this uh, case on the left here. Um, with the bat using the pitcher as its home. And then, of course, the guano will fall to the bottom of the pitcher, and then that nitrogen-rich uh, waste can be absorbed by the plant. Um, or this image in the center uh, of Nepenthes helmsleana, um, which attracts shrews that come and stand uh, right over the pitcher um, as they're attracted to uh, you know, nectar or other sorts of rewards uh, and basically use the pitcher then as, also as a toilet. This may sound like a curiosity or some sort of tall tale or, or maybe just, you know, how do you know this isn't happening by chance? Well, people have been intensely curious um, to these examples and have discovered that um, there are specific adaptations to this sort of uh, you know, to these mutualisms with these particular other animals. Uh, for example, uh, some pitcher plants will lose uh, the you know the sweet the smells and odors that will attract insects. Um, others have morphological changes uh, to the shape and dimensions of their pitcher uh, that make them more suitable to these sorts of. Uh, mutualisms with mammals rather than uh, simply capturing insects or other animals. And in fact, sometimes uh, they even produce dimorphic pitchers, 
with the pitchers uh, growing along the ground of a single organism uh, being more suited uh, for these pooping shrews, whereas other pitchers that are found higher up in the air will be more of the typical sort that are attracting insects. Um, as pitfall traps. Now we have pitcher plants too um, here in North America um, and these are in the family Sarsiniaceae which are actually asterids um, and quite distantly uh, related from the pitcher plants uh, that I've just been talking about. Um, so in fact this remarkable uh, you know morphology and ecology and physiology has evolved convergently um, in these two lineages. So just to highlight some of the contrast between these two uh, pitcher plants, uh, you can see um, some of the differences on this slide here. Um, on the left, in green, I have features of the Nepenthaceae, um, which is that the um, old world pitcher plants found in Indonesia Madagascar, uh, you know, various islands in the Indian Ocean, um, and a little bit into the northern tip of Australia. Um, as opposed to the Saraceni ACE, which are only found in North America. Uh, morphologically, the flowers uh, structure is quite different, both in terms of um, how they're arranged, you know, on an inflorescence in the Nepenthaceae versus singularly in the Saraceni ACE. Uh, but also in the specific floral structure, uh, you can uh, see on the left the monodelphous uh, stamens surrounding the single uh, pistil in the Nepenthaceae with four petals. Whereas in the Saraceni AC, uh, the stamens are free. You have these long um, petals and sepals, and many carpels fused together um, into a single pistil. You also see uh, differences in the structure of the pitchers. The Nepenthaceae is just the tip of the leaf uh, that's then elongated, and then um, from which develops the pitcher, whereas it's the entire blade um, in the Saraceniaceae. The next uh, family that I'll be talking about is the Caryophyllaceae. Um, and this family are called pinks, um, or also the carnation family. These plants are somewhat unique among the Caryophyllales for having anthocyanins, um, so they've lost the betalins and regained um, anthocyanin production. These plants are usually herbs, um, annuals or perennials, but not woody. Uh, it can be, they're most distinguishable by their opposite leaves um, and nodes that are often swollen, and I'll show pictures of these features um, in the next couple of slides. Um, the other important floral feature um, is that in many species the petals are often bilobed, uh, so the, each petal will be um, kind of notched at the tip or even divided into two large lobes. Or if not bilobed, uh, they'll have the claw and the limb, uh, claw and limb feature, just as we saw in the Saxifragales. Uh, the claw being the little uh, stalk, and then the limb being the rest of the petal uh, that's larger. There's a uh, Quite a few different genera that, of the Caryophyllaceae that are found um, in Arkansas. Uh, we have already had Stellario, met Stellaria media on our um, site ID list, uh, the small, kind of weedy, um, you know, rapidly growing um, in disturbed areas uh, herb. 
that has these unique leaves that are lobed almost to the entire length of the petal. Uh, so what you're seeing in this picture here uh, is a cross section or a longitudinal section of a flower. Um, and behind, there's only three petals, um, but each of them are so deeply lobed uh, that it really looks almost like there are six. Other uh, examples from this family uh, include the genera Cerastium, um, Arenaria, uh, Silene, um, all of which are uh, diverse um, herbs. Two other genera um, of Caryophyllaceae that are found here, Geocarpon um, and the introduced uh, Saponaria or Soapwort, a uh, plant that was has been used to um, add fragrance to soap. Of course, I don't expect you to memorize all of these different um, genera, but I am putting these pictures here because um, I think as, as you're out and about and maybe looking for plants, uh, to um, collect or to learn uh, for your field project or just uh, because you're curious, these pictures uh, might be helpful in starting to wrap your head around some of the diversity um, in the Caryophyllaceae that's here in Arkansas. Saponaria also uh, quite well shows the opposite leaves that are um, a useful um, identification feature in the Caryophyllaceae, as well as these swollen nodes uh, on the stem. Um, you can see they almost look like little knees or, or little bulbous uh, you know, expansions. And although sometimes that feature is absent in particular species, um, I think it you know, can definitely be helpful in identifying something as a Caryophyllaceae. Outside of Arkansas, uh, these plants have a worldwide distribution, especially uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And although some of the herbs can be uh, eaten as a, a salad, for example, um, probably the biggest economic importance are several cultivars such as carnations um, or dianthus that are very commonly planted um, and kind of important um, horticulturally. Last, but certainly not least, I'll be talking about the Cactaceae. This is one of a number of closely related families that are all succulent. And although this particular trait represents a synapomorphy for a number of different families, as you can see in this cladogram, um, it's also independently rose many, many times. Um, succulent really only means uh, a plant or a particular organ of a plant is fleshy or juicy. Um, and this could be the stem or the leaves, uh, you know, flowers, um, fruits, you know, any sort of feature could be succulent. I've already talked about, you know, Succulents having arisen in the Crassulaceae um, in the Saxifragales, uh, but you also see it in you know Euphorbia, the Apocynaceae, milkweed family, all sorts of other lineages that also find or that are adapted to uh, dry you know dry regions in which they might need to hold water for long periods of time. So zooming in a bit on the Cactaceae specifically, I think we're all kind of familiar with uh, cactus, but it certainly surprised me to learn that with the exception of one genus that's found in Africa, uh, the Cactaceae are only found in the New World. These plants, as I mentioned, have succulent stems um, that could be either ribbed or segmented, um, as in the case of uh, this Apuntia, or prickly pear cactus, to the left. The flowers are all uh, bisexual, and in many plants, uh, there'll be a you know, indeterminate number of tepals, 
um, and also an indeterminate, indeterminate number of stamens, just many, many of them. The ovary is inferior, and in fact, cactaceae have probably the most inferior ovaries of any group of plants. Um, as you'll see on a future slide, uh, the ovary is so inferior, it's not even just below um, the attachment point of the other floral parts, but it's completely recessed into uh, the stem. There, the gynoecium is made up of three to many fused carpels, um, and, uh, but also with a single locule or, or space. So the septa between these, those different carpels uh, has been lost. Ecologically, I think we're, you know, all pretty much on the same page that cactaceae live in uh, dry uh, environments. Although I think some people are surprised to learn that uh, there are species of prickly pear cactus in the genus Apuntia that can get as far north as the Canadian border um, throughout the, the Midwest. But uh, generally, the cactaceae are, are found in, in dry, hot locations. One of the physiological methods uh, or characteristics that cactaceae have um, that really helps them survive in those conditions is a modification of photosynthesis called CAM uh, photosynthesis. Um, and this stands for Crassulacean Acid Metabolism. Um, so in this case, instead of uh, the stomata being open and uh, carbon dioxide simply floating diffusing into the plant cell and then being fixed um, by the enzyme rubisco, uh, the stomata open at night only uh, for carbon dioxide to enter. And at night, of course, there's less sun, there's going to be less heat um, and transpiration, uh, that is water loss, uh, will be lowest. And so the CO2 can enter and then is stored as malic acid for the next day um, when the stomata are closed and then light um, can activate the, photosynth the photosynthesis mechanism to convert that malic acid um, into uh, sugars. Uh, CAM metabolism independently has evolved in many other angiosperm lineages as well, um, likely as a result of the warming um, and drying of the earth um, around the uh, Eocene. In terms of economic value of the cactaceae, um, some parts of the plant uh, can be eaten. Um, specifically the cactus fruits um, can be fleshy and, and quite tasty uh, berries and the stems uh, can be uh, prepared as nopales and eaten. Other economic importance of cacti include uh, numerous different cultivated ornamentals um, and some species of cactus are important um, as uh, ceremonial spiritual guides. For example, peyote um, is a cactus from the southwestern uh, North America. Uh, the is commonly known as a hallucinogen, um, but also very culturally important. Uh, to the indigenous people of that part of the continent. Similarly, the San Pedro cactus is another example of one that has uh, both hallucinogenic and then also um, cultural significance. On this slide, I've included a few more uh, images that illustrate some of the most important morphological features about the cactaceae that I want you to know. This, first of all, this photo in the middle uh, shows a longitudinal section of a cactus flower. And you can see the stamens are numerous. 
uh, the filaments are, are white, and then the anthers are pink on the end, and they're adnate to the tepals. So again, the base of the stamen is fused uh, to the base of the tepals. In the middle of the stamens coming up, you can see the style, um, and then the five uh, stigma lobes on the end. Uh, you can also see the uh, inferior ovary uh, nestled deep within uh, the stem on which the flower is attached. Uh, you can see the spines coming off of the outside of that structure. And that's one of the ways that it can tell us that what we're looking at is a ovary that's embedded within the stem. Spines, as I'll talk about briefly, are modified leaves, um, and leaves can only be found at nodes, um, and nodes are only found on stems, right? Leaves are attached to stems, they're not attached to ovaries or fruit parts. Um, and so that's, you know, perhaps the easiest way uh, that we could make that inference, but there are other anatomical features that could also um, indicate that this uh, stem is completely surrounding the ovary. Finally, you may be surprised to learn that some uh, species of cactus have leaves, um, you know, broad uh, green leaves. Uh, one example of that is the genus Pereschia, uh, that is within the Cactaceae, uh, but has these persistent broad leaves. In other species of cactus, the leaves are quickly deciduous, so they'll appear right as the new growth um, is developing, but then quickly fall away. And of course, uh, most of the time, the leaves have been modified into spines. As one might imagine, being a succulent plant in an area without water uh, may really open up your vulnerability to herbivores. And so most cacti have some sort of defenses, um, physical defenses, uh, to keep other organisms away. In most cases, these are uh, leaves reduced to, small, to spines, uh, like you can see on this prickly pear to the left. that are all born on small, short shoots called areoles. So one of the ways that we know that these are short shoots is, first of all, by there being multiple leaves attached, or modified leaves attached to the same point, but also through positional homology, as you can see on the top. Here's a species of cactus uh, that includes some of the deciduous leaves I mentioned previously, um, one of which is indicated by the red arrow. And right where you would expect the axillary bud to be, right in that axle of the leaf, right above the leaf, uh, you'll see the areole with several spines protruding from it. And similarly, um, at the upper right of this image, you can see another leaf uh, at another node on that stem. Sometimes in addition to the uh, the large spines, you'll also find small barbed spines called glochids. And you can see a microscopic image of one of those spines down below. Oftentimes these spines are so small they, they look just like hairs. Um, and it can often be small enough that if you brush up against them, you can't easily pull them out. And they can be very you know, painful or itchy. In addition, um, other cacti sometimes will have uh, true hairs, especially the barrel cacti, um, to provide another uh, physical barrier uh, to any potential herbivores, either instead of or in addition to uh, the larger spines. Finally, in addition to the fence, sometimes the spines of certain species of cactuses, such as um, the chala cactuses, can be helpful in dispersal of the organism. In these cases, the, cac the segmented cacti, um, in which you'll have different, pa you know, different pads or units, um, will break off, allowing the cactus to spread vegetatively. And the spines uh, might be helpful in um, 
grabbing on to other organisms or animals um, to help dislodge uh, the the pad of the cactus um, and move it to another place where then it will you know continue to grow um, and and take root so that's all I have to say about the cactaceae and really all I have to say about the eudicots um, for this week's lectures however I think it's a good time to go over a little bit the difference between spines and prickles and thorns these different types of uh, physical painful defenses. I've mentioned this a few times in different contexts, but I want to have it all together in one place for you. The important difference between using the terms spines versus prickles versus thorns in botany all has to do with homology. Spines are modified leaves, thorns are modified stems, and prickles are um, any sharp protrudence from the epidermis. What this means is to determine whether something's a spine or a prickle or a thorn, it's important to think critically about, you know, the position of the feature um, and also how it's maybe related to other morphological features or other organs um, on the organism. So, for example, um, thorns and spines will always and only always appear at nodes because leaves and stems only appear at nodes. Prickles, in contrast, uh, can appear anywhere on the organism, including fruits, stems, leaves. Um, I don't know of cases in which there's prickles on flowers, um, but you can really have, you know, it can really be anywhere with this epidermal tissue. In addition, um, spines can be modified leaves, but also any other structure that's associated with leaves, including stipules, petioles, etc. Um, so I just want uh, you to take a moment um, to quiz yourself on some of these different structures and try to figure out uh, whether they're spines or thorns or prickles. So pause the slideshow and take some time to try to figure out which of uh, these uh, are which. And here are your answers for each um, and some examples of the particular species that the picture came from. So on the left, we have spines that were the result of stipules. Um, and you can see they're associated with the base of the petiole. Um, this is from a black locust. Next to it, we have prickles from a rose. Roses don't have thorns, they have prickles. And you can see they're uh, kind of haphazardly scattered along the stem. And one of the other features of um, epidermal prickles is that they're often easier to remove than any of the other uh, types of armed uh, features. Um, so if you ever tried to just, you know, it's quite easy to snap off the uh, prickle off of a rose, um, whereas to break off a spine or a a thorn is going to be much more difficult because uh, you have to you are breaking you know through much more developed tissue. Third, we have petiolar spines. Um, this is from a desert uh, shrub or small tree called the Fucuria or the Ocotillo. Um, and here the part that is sharp is actually the base of the petiole that's retained. Um, and so technically those are spines as well. And then finally, uh, this buckthorn, uh, that is a true thorn uh, because it's part of the stem 
uh, that comes to a point. So if you want to read more descriptions or see more examples of any of these, I definitely recommend this uh, slideshow. Uh, there are many online, but this one is one of the most comprehensive um, and also has a wide variety of good examples of these features in all sorts of different types of plants. With that, I will conclude this uh, audio lecture. Don't forget to send me at least two content-related questions uh, from this lecture via email, and I will collate those and return uh, responses to everybody. Uh, so I want to make sure that I can come back and address topics that might be unclear or that you might simply be interested in learning more about. Um, so I will uh, please send those to me uh, before Thursday. Um, and I will try to uh, get those turned back around to you um, no later than the weekend. On Friday in lecture, we will be um, discussing uh, the next lit assignment uh, about hybridization and populus. And uh, Dylan will be leading us in that discussion. Um, and with the beginning of class, I'll also, also have a chance to um, answer any questions that you might have about any of these topics verbally. Um, and also we'll be going over a little bit more detail about the uh, different types of fruits and how to, uh, what's the distinction among these different fruit types. So I hope uh, your week is off to a good start and I will see you on Friday.